Good morning. Welcome to worship. It's lovely to see you all visiting and catching up. Um, and it certainly feels like fall out there. <laughs> so it's our first day of church school today, but we won't actually have Rally Sunday for a couple weeks. So Rally Sunday is the 23rd, which I'm sure means that there are signups uh, for bringing sandwiches and desserts around the corner. So you can find that. There are couple of refreshments out there for some fellowship time following worship um, and an opportunity to sign up to Acolyte uh, with some great pictures of Acolytes from the past couple years. So we begin a new school year um, and a new liturgical year in some ways as it matches the school year. It's a, a great joy to have my good friend Eric Smith here with us this morning. Usually if Eric's here it means I'm not. Um, so we never get to do this together uh, here and so it's really fun to be together in worship and we'll be preaching a dialogue sermon which you might actually find entertaining so 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 welcome to eric after worship today eric and i will be hosting uh in the last classroom on this level at the end of the hall why open and affirming so hopefully you received in the mail your call to meeting uh and the covenant language uh that we're proposing as a constitutional amendment in a couple weeks uh so those letters went out in the mail and i know that the mail is imperfect so there are extra copies of those mailings around the corner um, on the table. So if you didn't get yours yet, or if you are not a member of the church, but you're curious, uh, you're welcome to come to the meeting. We just will be particular about who votes. Um, but all of those details are in the letter around the corner, so you can pick that up. But in anticipation of that, and as we continue to move through this study process, um, Eric and I will be hosting Why Open and Affirming uh, after worship today at the end of the hall. So those of you that came to that session that Eric hosted back in June, some of those questions uh, will repeat and some of them will be a little different because we're at a different moment in this process than we were in June so we welcome you it's a little bit of a repeat session with a little bit of newness in it so so you're welcome if we are too big to fit in that room we'll move um, so as we gear up in the fall, Wolfboro Reads will resume this Tuesday afternoon back in the gathering space uh, with conversation about Brene Brown's book, uh, Rising Strong. Um, I finally solved the confusion around the reading lists. Some um, transplant from All Saints dropped off a different copy of the reading list that only had Pastor Bill's book suggestions on it and didn't have any dates on it. So I don't know where they come from, that came from, and Bill doesn't know where that came from, but we got rid of those versions of the reading lists. And so the longer and fuller reading lists with the dates of the books for the fall are in the back, and there are more copies of those. Let's see. You'll also perhaps see that in the gathering space, there's a cart full of books. Margaret Marshner and I spent all of Friday afternoon um, sorting through the first round of books that have been in storage in the attic from the church library from several years ago. So most of those books are um, unloved. They were never checked out of the church library. Um, they clearly have made their way to the church by donation or as extras. And so we're thinning them out. We're really only intending to keep the reference books that are sort of timeless on those bookshelves. So these are yours for the taking. Um, Margaret and I will continue to sort through. I think we have another like 12 or 15 boxes to go through. Um, so find a new home for these books. Feel free to take one or take many to read them, to gift them, to use them as doorstops um, or whatever else might make you happy because there are plenty more where those came from. And so we'll work our way through that as... Um, our properties committee is urging us to clean out the attic because it's a bit of a fire hazard at the moment. So we're trying to thin out the attic. Um, the blessing of the animals is approaching as we move into the fall. In your bulletin and the signs around the church, it lists the blessing of the animals as the first Sunday in October. Um, and I decided that that made it a little too full and busy. Um, that is, of course, a communion Sunday. So I'm going to change the date of the blessing of the animals to the second Sunday in October. So we'll change that in the upcoming postings. But the 14th will be the blessing of the animals. 
And my last announcement for you is to share with you um, that I have accepted a very part-time position on, at Brewster campus as the community chaplain. Um, and so I'll, many of you know I have been flitting back and forth uh, in the past couple years in an informal way, and we put some structure on that. Um, so I uh, will spend some more intentional time at Brewster for six or eight hours a week, um, and I think that that will be a good thing for the church and for the school and to find find those communities um, overlapping all the more. So I'll put more details in the Chimes article that'll come out this week, and you'll hear uh, Brewster make a press announcement about that, but I didn't want you to hear about it in the newspaper. Um, <laughs> so so um, I'm excited uh, to make formal those shared uh, relationships and to continue in a long tradition of the church and the academy sharing people and space and time together. Okay, those are all my announcements, I promise. Have I forgotten anything? All right, then let us be, oh wait, Krista. Oh, okay. Oh, it's about the Wicked Fit Run. Is it in the bulletin? It's in the bulletin. Um, so please look in your bulletin about the Wicked Fit Run. You can also walk. Um, so wicked it's not fit all run, walk. running, but it's to help raise money for Hope House. And so I have started a FCCW team and if you would like to join our team or support our team, please go to the website that I listed in the bulletin. Or if you need help finding it, certainly contact me. Thanks. Great. Yes, Bev. I'm sure they can. I'm sure you could sure sponsor you the run without going online to do that. Yes. So. I think that there are details in your bulletin. There certainly are posters around, and I'll have, I'll have to look that up. But I'm I'm assuming that you probably will write it to um, Hope House. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll figure it out. Okay. Let us be in a spirit of worship as we continue with our affirmation of inclusion, which comes to you from Peg Crawford this week. Whoa. <laughs> We're the same height. It's like the first time ever. <laughs> I asked God for courage, and he sent me my granddaughter. This is part of our church family. This is Megan. Hi. And uh, now I only have to find my notes. If you'll excuse me a minute. There we go. Good morning. <laughs> Thanks for coming. My story goes back to actually Meg and I sat down and decided to do a little bit of a timeline. So I went back to when I was 15. And my dad was working with the NAACP to hire uh, people of color, because that's what you called it then. And one Easter weekend, he said, could you please come with me to uh, Roxbury, Mass, because we need extra help. And I went, and I was waiting on this black woman, and she said, she piled all her things on the counter, and then she disappeared. So I went on and waited on other people, and then all of a sudden, I heard this big, loud voice saying, Listen, white girl, if you don't want to wait on me, you just say so. And I thought, oh, my word, I was, I was devastated. I'd been taught not to be prejudiced. It never occurred to me that black people were prejudiced or anyone else. And so I think from that point on, I was determined to be accepting no matter what, because over the years, as I thought about that woman, I thought about the things that she was going through and why she reacted the way she did. So then here I am in my 30s, and my sister brings home a, the love of her life, an Indian and a Hindu to boot. 
I never even thought much about it. He was wonderful. He was just the greatest guy. They struggled. They were married in the Catholic Church. But my parents, who taught me not to be prejudiced, struggled. So the wedding was from our house. And I'm mentioning it to my sister the other day, I said, you know, I keep thinking, you know, it's a look that people give. And she says, yes, Peg. She says, it's the look, and you should talk about it. Because she said, we were in church, and this woman wasn't very friendly. But then it came time for the sign of peace, and I turned around, and we shook hands. And she shook hands, but the look she gave us. I had a biracial marriage. I said to myself, I never even thought that that marriage was biracial. I never saw the color. I never saw the difference. So then I go on to my niece, Jen, who is a gay woman. And she didn't have to come out to me. She didn't have to say anything. She showed up with her friend, and she came to visit. And I loved her, and she was well-loved unconditionally. Later on, I discovered that my granddaughter in college was bisexual. I thought, I never knew a bisexual person. And I thought, well, what difference does it make? I love her anyway, unconditionally. Then there's Danny. Danny's a friend of the family for years. 45 years I've known that young man and the struggles he's gone through. He had finally been offered a position in a church. He'd been brought up in a congregational church, very strict. By 15, he was through with church. He um, went off to college. And I just want to read you a small excerpt of his testimony to the church he is now the music minister to. Out on my own at college at 19, and then in my own apartment in Exeter at 21, I quickly spiraled downhill into an abyss of alcoholic jackpots that got me into more and more trouble. I had been arrested, lost my license, lost my friends. I had little interest in life. I had been to rehab, and alcoholism had stolen any sense of self I might have had. I got sober in 1985 and found the God of my understanding in AA. There I found out I was okay. I found out I could worship a God that I didn't understand and that it was okay. I found out that I could openly identify as a scared gay man and that it was okay. I found out about the unconditional love and acceptance and I soon came to know the God of my understanding. With the blessing of my niece and granddaughter's trust to tell me something that is such a large part of who they are, and knowing I will accept them without question, it made it clear to me that I would do the same for Danny, no questions asked. I knew Danny from the time he was 10. He was gay and accepted. He didn't know that I knew, but it didn't matter. He was just him, and now I can see the courage it took just to be him. To wrap it up, I got a call from one of my granddaughters. I have six, six granddaughters. I got a call the other night, and she said, I'm transgender. Can you accept me as a grandson? Will you call me by that name? And of course, I love her unconditionally. My response to my granddaughter is how I believe my God would respond to anyone. It breaks my heart to know that there's a chance that my brother-in-law, niece, granddaughters, and Danny may not feel comfortable within these walls, but I believe my God would welcome them with open arms, and so should we. Thank you. Please join me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Happy are those 
whose help and hope is in God. Who made heaven, earth, the sea, and all that is in them. God keeps faith forever and executes justice for the oppressed. God gives food to the hungry and sets the prisoners free. God will reign forever for all generations. Praise the Lord. Our opening hymn is In the Bulb There is a Flower. It's 433 in your black hymnal. Please join me in the unison prayer of invocation and Lord's Prayer. God of being, you move through us and in us and beyond us as Christ and Spirit and Creator. You call us into being, into life, and call us to life abundantly. You guide us in ways of being that allow others to live, grow, and flourish. Release us from the burdens that hold us down so we may move in all the ways you have called us to in this dance of life. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. I see church school children, because it is the first day of church school. So come on up for some chance of steps time. I sit next to you. Good morning. Oh my goodness, you guys look sleepy over here. Good morning. morning. You guys look more awake over there. (laughs) (laughs) How's school so far? Good. Good. It seems short. short. School seems short? Oh, okay. I'm going to ask you that question in a couple months. (laughs) How's school on this side? Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Everyone loves school. Everybody loves school. School's great. Because it's like three days old. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. So we, you're starting a new church school curriculum. We're starting a new church school year. 
Um, and our reading today is Noah's Ark. Is that a story you know? <laughs> yes. What do you know about that story? What are some of the things you remember about Noah's Ark? That's good. And that's great. That's, uh, James rocks. So you, you've got the, almost the whole story there. But then what happens? For like a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. 40 days. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's right? So there's time. an ark. God decides God's going to punish the world. God says to Noah, get on the ship, bring your family, and bring animals. All the animals? All the animals? Do you remember? Do you remember that silly song? The Lord said to Noah, there's going to be a floody, floody. Lord said to Noah, there's going to be a floody, floody. Get those children out of the muddy, muddy children of the Lord. Right? No anyway, it goes on, on and forever, on and right? on and on. Yeah, yeah. Which we're not going to do. We're not going to do all the verses, it but... It names a lot of animals. But it's not all the animals. It's... How many of every animal? Two. Two of every animal. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. It was like a hint. So, so we get all the animals on board the ark, but then it rains for 40 days, and then what happens? It rains for 40 days, and there's a big flood, like you said. There's a yes. rainbow. So that's kind of the end of the story, at least as far as we're concerned today. <laughs> um, so a lot of times we, we focus on the animals because the animals are cute. Um, and, you know, there's, we, we, we like to imagine what it must have been like with all of those animals all in one place. It seems kind of cool as long as you don't imagine the smell. Um, <laughs> and, but... We, we're left with, with this rainbow at the end. What's the rainbow for? So, because there's always that picture, right? It, it's kind of, we have that picture and everything's happening all at once. You've got all the people on the ark and there's the rainbow, which is kind of and two confusing. different parts of the story that's all crammed together. But the rainbow comes after, after the flood's over and the rain is over and everybody gets off the ark and the rainbow is a sign of God's promise that even though there was this really big storm and, and everything got wiped away except for what was on the ark, that God said God's never going to do that again. And in fact, God makes a promise, to, not just to Noah, but to all of Noah's descendants forever and ever and ever that God's going to remember this promise that God makes. And the rainbow is there to remind God, but also to remind us. And one of the things that that rainbow teaches us is that, do you remember in the, in the very beginning of the Bible where it says God said, let there be light? And there was light. And it was good. And the light is part of the promise because you can't have the rainbow without light. Because light is, the rainbow is light. The rainbow that is light that sometimes we think of is all one thing. Light's just what comes from the light bulbs and what comes from the sun and what gets reflected by the moon. But light's lots of things. And it's not just bright white, it's red and orange and yellow and blue and violet green and green and indigo it's all those things together that we get to see little glimpses of and the rainbow have, how, how many of you have seen a rainbow actually in the sky nobody over here but everybody oh. over here oh okay, okay. All right, good. everybody all right, over okay. here too <laughs> how long do rainbows last not very long not very long right but there's light even after the rainbow disappears, right? So the rainbow's still there in the light, but we just get to see it. 
for a few minutes. And the rainbow, exactly. It's just a glimpse of what's there all the time. And even though, so that's the sign of God's promise, we, don't, we might not see it all the time, but God's promise is there all the time. We just have to remind ourselves sometimes just the way God puts it there to remind us and to remind God that God's promise to love us is always there. No matter what shade of light we happen to be reflecting, we are part of God's light. And God promises to love us and to care for us and protect us. Whether we remember it or not, God's promise is there. And whether we see it or not, God's promise is there. All right. You seem entirely unenthused. Mm. But we're going to send you to church school anyway. Where you can learn more about Noah. You can and get learn more, more about the rainbow. And you can be more awake. <laughs> Should we pray? Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for all the colors of the rainbow, for all the creatures of the world, for Noah and for the boat and even for the rainwater. We ask that you be with us always when we remember that you love us and when we forget, when we have been unkind and when we have been perfect, when we have been curious and when we have been bored. We give thanks that you are with us always. Amen. We turn to the book of Genesis. Um, the citation in your bulletin is half right. Um, as we were preparing, we realized that um, the resource that we use to name the scriptures misquoted the actual chapters and verses. So it is Genesis, and it does start in chapter 6, but we actually are going to pick up the story at verse 5, and you're going to get some pieces of chapter 8 and chapter 9 so that you get the whole of the Noah story. So you will hear as we hear this story, you'll be reminded and it will become obvious to you what happens throughout all of Genesis, um, which is that the story kind of repeats and folds in on itself, and sometimes they agree and sometimes they are dissonant because we know that Genesis had different authors. Um, we can get really technical and we can pull apart the different sources of Genesis, but the truth is uh, it is enough to simply know that there are multiple authors at work here, um, and in the spirit of the rainbow, where all things together are good, uh, Genesis kind of crams them all together, so you'll hear it repeat in on itself a couple times. This is a familiar story, of course. Um, we hope that we're going to read it together. You'll hear it a little differently this morning, as one of us plays the narrator and one of us plays God. So from the book of Genesis, chapter 5. The Lord saw that humanity had become thoroughly evil. And on the earth, and that there, and every idea in their minds thought up was completely evil. The Lord regretted making human beings on the earth, and he was heartbroken. So the Lord said, I will wipe off of the land the human race that I created, from human beings to livestock to the crawling things to the birds in the sky, because I regret I ever made them. But as for Noah... The Lord approved of him. These are Noah's descendants. In his generation, Noah was a moral and exemplary man. He walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. In God's sight, the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God saw that the earth was corrupt because all creatures behaved corruptly on the earth. God said to Noah... The end has come for all creatures since they have filled the earth with violence. I am now about to destroy them along with the earth. So make a wooden ark. Make the ark with nesting places and cover it inside and out with tar. For this is how you should make it. 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for the ark and complete it one foot from the top. Put a door in its side, and in the hold below, make a second and third deck. I am bringing now the floodwaters over the earth to destroy everything under the sky that breathes. Everything on earth is about to take its last breath. But I will set up my covenant with you. You will go into the ark together with your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives. 
And from all living things, from all creatures, you are to bring a pair, male and female, into the ark with you to keep them alive. From each kind of bird, from each kind of livestock, and from each kind of everything that crawls on the ground, a pair from each will go in with you to stay alive. Take some from every kind of food and stow it as food for you and for the animals. Noah did everything exactly as God commanded him. After 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark he had made. He sent out a raven, and it flew back and forth until the waters over the entire earth had dried up. Then he sent out a dove to see if the waters on all the fertile land had subsided. But the dove found no place to set its foot. It returned to him in the ark, since the waters still covered the entire earth. Noah stretched out his hand, took it, and brought it back into the ark. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out from the ark again. And the dove came back to him in the evening, grasping a torn olive leaf in its beak. Then Noah knew that the waters were subsiding from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent out the dove, but did not come back to him again. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I am now setting up my covenant with you and with your descendants and with every living being with you, with birds and with the large animals and with all the animals of the earth, leaving the ark with you. I will set up my covenant with you so that never again will all life be cut off by floodwaters. There will never again be a flood that destroys the earth. God said, This is the symbol of the covenant that I am drawing up between me and you and every living thing with you on behalf of every future generation. I have placed my bow in the clouds, and it will be the symbol of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will remember the covenant between me and you and every living being among all the creatures, and floodwaters will never again destroy all creatures. The bow will be the clouds, in the clouds, and upon seeing it, I will remember the enduring covenant between God and every living being of all earth's creatures. God said to Noah, This is the symbol of the covenant that I have set up between me and all creatures on the earth. Here ends our reading. May God add blessing to the reading of these words. Would you join us in the spirit of prayer? Gracious and holy God, you speak to us through ancestors of faith, through stories that are older than time, that come to us again and again from one culture to another, with one particular set of details to another, as specific as how big to build a boat, and as broad as one of every kind. Help us to hear this story anew in our hearts and our minds this morning, that the meditations of our hearts and the words on our lips might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight our Savior, and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. So whenever I read this story, whenever I hear this story, I always think of a young man that I met early in my ministry when I was serving a big church, um, and I was largely in charge of the youth group. I was in charge of uh, the youth groups from middle school to high school and into young adulthood. And I got, as pastors sometimes do, a call from a set of parents um, who explained to me that their son had gotten in trouble and that they had required as part of his punishment to come and meet with me. Which is never, like, exciting for the pastor. No pastor wants any child's punishment to be meeting with the pastor, right? Like, this just doesn't set one up for, like, a good encounter with church down the road. But there's really only one answer when one is the pastor in this situation, which is to say, of course, I will meet with your child. So in the parents uh, come with this 12-year-old boy whose shoulders are slugged and um, he is bent over in um, shame and absolute dread. It is very clear they have dragged him to this uh, meeting and to this moment. And they deposit him in my office and they say, we're going to get a cup of coffee and we'll be back in 20 minutes. And so he comes into my office and we close the door and he sits down and I say, all right, Alex, what did you do? He says, well, I don't know. I said, well, why are you here? I, I, I got suspended from school, he says. And I said, well, so what did you get suspended for? And he said, well, I stole. You stole what did you steal, Alex? Well, I stole a cookie. Wait a minute, you stole a cookie. So 
Why did you steal a cookie? Because I wanted it. Okay, so tell me the story. Well, I was in line at lunch, and I'd paid for my lunch, and the kid in front of me had bought a cookie in the lunch line, and I decided I wanted it, so I stole it from him. And they saw me do it, and I got in trouble, and I got kicked out. Okay, Alex, so did you, like, not have enough money? Did you not? No, no, I had money. Well, so then why did you do it? Well, I, I did it because I wanted to see what would happen. Okay. I said, so what is going on? What is going on in your life? Like, what is this about? So he sat there for a while in this awkward silence, and then he became very emotional. And as he teared up and he uh, twisted himself into knots, he said to me, when I was in church school, they taught me about Noah's Ark. I said, okay. Now I'm really sitting there thinking, where are we going with this, right? He says, I had world history this year, and I learned that there never was anything in world history where the earth was flooded and entirely destroyed. And if what they taught me at church is not true, then what is true in the world? And how do I know I can trust anything? So we had this existential crisis around Noah's Ark and what is good and what is bad and what is honest and what is not and how 12-year-olds test the world to see what is good. So I cannot help but think about Alex when I read this story, but I also, it sits, what sits within me is the essence of the question around what is the faith of a child and what is the faith of an adult? And where is the moment where we move from the story being about animals in the boat and a rainbow in the sky to understanding why it is we continue to tell the story? Why do we continue to tell the story when we put an end to childish things? So we tell the story, Gina, because it's a fascinating story. It's a story, as you said, where we go back to the beginning. Genesis is the book of beginnings, plural, where we learn about the beginnings of all kinds of things. We learn about the beginning of creation, and we learn about the beginning of God's relationship with people and people's first struggles to be in relationship to God. And one of the things we learn about with God is that as we tell this story, that just a few chapters after God said, let there be light and let us create people and look at how everything's good, God has second thoughts. God looks at everything and says, well, that seemed like a good idea at the time, but now everything's wrong. And what if I just start over, but maybe not from scratch. Maybe there's like a few things from the first draft that I could save and I can just copy and then paste them back in later. But in the meantime, I can just delete everything that I wrote. So we have this wrestling with what is God's intention and, and God is changing in the story. God seems to change God's mind. Which is crazy, because we are people who call on the ever-unchanging way of God, right? God who is timeless and who is unchanged and who never changes, right? It does change. In this story, God seems to change his mind both at the beginning and the end, because he has regrets about the creation, and then he has regrets about the flood. And so he ties this rainbow ribbon around his finger to remind God's self... Because God is also forgetful. We right, not to, not to destroy everything in creation again. So we tell this story, this, this story of the flood and the animals and everything, but it is a story of what's happening now as much as it's a story of what happened then. One of the reasons that children love this story is because there's such a blurred line between story and reality. They don't have to know the facts versus the purpose. And so they can imagine every animal on earth, or at least two of every animal on earth, on a boat. That's fine. Why are we telling the story? 
And we do tell the story. Cultures all over the world have a flood story. It's not always about a guy named Noah, and the ship doesn't always have a blueprint, but there, in every great culture of the world, there is a flood story. There is a story that gets told, and so it begs the question, why do, we, why do our faith, all of our faith traditions, revolve around story? Certainly one of the things we learn as we read on in the Bible and we become followers of Jesus is that we have to find ourselves in the story, to identify with a certain character, to imagine a certain context. So in this story, it's really inviting and easy to think of ourselves as Noah, right? The blameless individual amongst the whole sea of rotten tomatoes who is the only one who is blameless and worthy of saving. It's really tempting to think, well, in this story, I would be Noah. Is anyone here Noah? Is anyone here the blameless person with blameless children and blameless children's wives? Or do we sometimes feel like we are a mess. Everything around us is a mess. Everything is disordered and chaos and... Wicked and, and evil. Evil. And do we wonder sometimes when we read this story about whether this could all happen again, whether everything could just fall down around us, and how would we ever stop it? Well, and surely as uh, we move into hurricane season again and we prepare for some enormity of storms and we see wildfires that are destroying land, we can't help but think, has God forgotten that there's a rainbow in the sky and God has promised to never again destroy the world? And who will we be saved by? I think one of the things that's interesting in this story uh, for me, after I dismiss the fact that, okay, I'm not so blameless as to be Noah, everybody else gets saved by association, which we definitely do a lot of in the world now, right? If I just come down on the right side of history, if I join the right club, if I vote the right way, if I uh, associate myself with the right-minded people, then like the giraffes um, and the wives and the sons and whoever else is on the boat, I can get saved by association. I can ride the coattails of those who are already uh, on the boat. But what about the people that didn't make it on the boat? Not only the people, but the other creatures. Right, like the dinosaurs. Because, well, yeah, well, we, and, 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 and why did Noah have to save the mosquitoes to begin with if he didn't save the dinosaurs? I know. But... What about all of the, the creatures in our imagination or the, that we know for a fact didn't make it this far in, in the Earth's story, in the creation story? And aren't going to make it into the next iteration of creation as we watch species around us uh, go extinct and, and move into the great void of history. But if we go back to the kind of childlike faith, which should not all be thrown out, of imagination and what else could there be, I do think about some of those things that are so easy for us as children to um, proclaim are real and are steadfast and do exist. Like dragons. Did dra dragons must have not made it on the ark because we don't see them anymore except for when we do because we still use dragons in our imagination. We still have those fears that dragons represent. Sometimes we invite processes into our church where we open up boxes that we thought we might have packed away, mm -hmm. and those fears emerge again, either the fear of what dragons lurk outside or lurk within fire-breathing unknowns, right? <laughs> like on those ancient maps where it used to say at the certain edge, there be dragons. If we do this, there be dragons. But of course, the flip side to the dragons are the unicorns, right? <laughs> the happy, wonderful unicorns that are magical, that um, are a mythical creature in and of themselves, that hold for us perhaps images of hope and of beauty and of healing, right? Some of that original mythology around the unicorn is that the horn of the unicorn um, contains within it this magic healing tonic. 
which I'm not so quick to say uh, heals us from physical ailments, but in this, if we're imagining what are our internal dragons and our external dragons, then what are the ways that we internally need to be healed and we externally need to be healed um, in the ways that we are church, in the ways that we um, love or affirm or have confidence or courage to think of ourselves in the ways that we uh, believe that what comes in the unknown is not necessarily to be afraid of, but to welcome um, with all good things and all good dreams. So, so if, if we are thinking about this as the church and where uh-huh. does the church find itself in mm-hmm. this story, who is the church? If, if, if maybe we're not Noah, if maybe we're not the perfect people, if maybe we're not the animals who are just dragged along. Then maybe we're we... the ark, right? Well, the we... ark provides place of sanctuary and refuge. We see uh, the birds that flit and float in and out um, who need some rest as the tumult of the chaos of creation and the flood is there. Uh, we see Noah invite uh, the dove to come back and to find rest and dry ground and to be replenished and nourished. So the church could certainly be sanctuary in that way, to be an inclusive place where whether you are raven or dove, whether you are giraffe or elephant, you can come back and be fed um, to go out again um, and surf the waves of chaos and tumult that is the world. Or is the church the rainbow? Is the church the sign? Is the church the the Thing that is set high for everyone both inside and outside to remember not only God's promise but the promise of our relationship with God. Are we the rainbow that refracts all kinds of different light but all symbolizing God's light? Reminding ourselves not only who we are but who we're called to be. Yeah, to be not the passive goers on the boat, um, to assume that there is some magical Noah who's going to decide who gets saved, but to instead build the boat ourselves and welcome all the people on the boat, because if we don't have some of every kind, of every um, persuasion and taste and light and beauty, then we are not whole, then the ark is not full, and we are not the new people of God. You know, it reminds me of that quote by Marianne Williamson, the one, as we talked with the kids just now, about light and the ways that we are differently uh, reflecting God's light. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. It is the unicorn, not the dragon. So we could be all over the place in this story. But who do we want to be? Who are we called to be? Are we called to be bearers of the light despite our own fears of darkness and chaos? Are we called to go out and shine forth God's light to remind ourselves and the world of God's promise? Because if God needs a reminder, a string on the finger, then we surely do. Amen. May it be so. Prayer is number 362 in your black hymnal, When Love is Found. I know we're running dreadfully late. I know we're running dreadfully late.
I invite you to be seated. We take a time to share prayer concerns with one another as we gather in worship. We take time to look through the windows of the ark and see how high the floodwaters are. And they do feel like they're rising in these days when there are hurricanes and wildfires and there are wars and there are refugees looking for dry land in Syria and there are persecuted people still of more than a generation in Myanmar. And so we take time also to take stock of joy, of new love being found and new lives in the world. Um, I bring you, so what time is it? Is it? It's after 10.30. So Carol Thompson at the 7.30 service told us that um, she is expecting her first great-grandchild to be born by C-section at 10.30 this morning. So if all went according to plan, then Carol Thompson has a great-grandchild. Um, um, and so we have no idea uh, of the gender of the baby, and nor does it matter as long as there is a healthy child and a healthy mother on the other end. Uh, Carol waits. Uh, with hope and with joy. Um, we also give thanks that uh, Tom and Phyllis Chamber's daughter, Stacy, uh, there'll be a wedding next week, um, and I have the great joy of getting to go down and be part of that celebration. So Blair will be here in the pulpit with you next week. Um, and so just uh, great joy for love uh, being found between Stacy and Ashok. So uh, we would covet your prayers for that celebration next weekend. Are there? Let us have some time then of silent prayer. Holy and gracious God, we give thanks that you are a changing God, that you come with us through flood and fire, that you come with us through silence and darkness, that you come with us into mourning and joy and praise, that you are with us in the birth of new babies and new love being found, that you are with us when the challenge seems ongoing and the floodwaters rise. You are with us in the ballot box, and you are with us at the altar. You are with us in the hospital rooms, and when we take to the streets, and when we stand in classrooms, and we learn and we teach, and when we worship and we pray, when we seek sanctuary in arcs that might look like a church, and when we find such sanctuary in the glory and the beauty of creation, too. Nourish us and encourage us, and then send us back out into the world where the floodwaters rise and we are called to be your people. We are grateful to be your rainbow people. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Nothing can trouble, nothing can frighten, those who seek God shall never go hunting. Nothing to trouble, not a despite it. So We are invited whenever we come together to worship to gather up uh, the best of ourselves, to gather up our hopes and our dreams, our treasures and our prayers, and present them as offering to the Lord our God. May our morning offering be received. dedication. Generous God, God bless, bless the, gifts the gifts we have gathered, gathered today, today that, that we may use them to protect the afflicted and bring greater justice to your world. world. 
Amen. Amen. So our closing hymn is number 391 in your Black New Century hymnal, In the Midst of New Dimensions. <laughs> people and ours is the journey and we are a love song yet to be sung so go out on this day and follow the rainbow the fiery pillar of god that calls us out of these walls and into the storms of the world to proclaim light and goodness and love and courage and compassion 
to love and serve in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Good gasoline. 